having sunlight sounds nice. I have like a lamp in front of my face just to make sure it looks like I'm in sun, but there's no sun. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to do the same for a little bit light. Yeah. I'm going to go to like pale light so I can imitate the sunshine. It's only coming from one corner. Oh, yeah, much better. You can see the dark PhD circles underneath my eyes perfectly. Yeah. They, I, I really think a PhD I, would be I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey everyone, hello, and can everybody hear me? We are about to start. It's very nice to see you all here. It's uh, many people here. It's um, gonna be gonna be very good. Um, yes, my name is um, Evgenia, and I'm a director, of media, at the State Culture Heritage Group, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's event. Um, so this, pan this panel discussion is a part of the International Archaeology Day celebrations and that would normally take place on um, 3rd of October. And today uh, we are doing it um, online, but uh, in, under normal circumstances, we would do it, uh, of course, uh, in a face-to-face -face, um, conference. So the topics of this discussion are related to archaeology and cultural, cu cultural heritage. And this discussion will seek to shift seek to share the experience of individual panelists on the subject and how we can work together as a community from various fields of cultural heritage to combine our knowledge for a better future. And um, I would like to thank um, very much to um, all of our participants and online followers around the world, as well as our panelists and guests, and especially our partners, the Archaeological Institute of America, and our main partners and moderators, um, Natasha from Behind the Travel, Megan called Egyptian Rose, and Laura from Las Plumas de Simur, as well as Nadim from Erano Turan, Amelia from Amelia the Archaeologist, and Milena from um, Mimo Artis. Um, okay, let's start with, um, with the discussion. Um, we're all very excited, and our moderator for this session is going to be Megan Kamorek, who is an archaeologist and Egyptologist um, researching Theban graffiti. And she's also an expert presenter at um, Past Preservers. And I would like to uh, hang over to you, Megan, and you can say a couple of words more about yourself if you like. All right. Well, as you guys heard, my name is Megan Kamorik. Uh, I've worked in Peru, Belize, and Egypt with various teams and projects. I currently research Theban graffiti, but I started out just studying ancient graffiti in general. Uh, my biggest focus is looking at how ancient graffiti can help us understand modern graffiti and how native communities can use graffiti to reclaim and reoccupy space that is historically theirs. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how we're going to delve into cultural heritage in the 21st century, because it's something that I'm very fascinated about. And by the sounds of it, before we even started this recording, it sounds like a lot of people have a lot to say, and I'm very excited. So. Basically, I'm gonna ask some questions. I will give you guys the floor to discuss and I think we will be good. Uh, towards the end, we will open it up for further questions. If anyone has any, please pop them in the chat below or on YouTube and hopefully we can get to those. But if not, we will post the answers to that in a future date. But yeah, first question, is everyone ready? I guess that is a first question. So second question. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start with, what does cultural heritage look like to you where you're from and your experience as an archaeologist? So think about that. And if someone has anything they would like to say, please just turn on your mic and jump in because trying to find all of your faces on my phone is very difficult. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, can I please start just uh, properly introducing myself? Um, so uh, I don't know if everybody here, well, it seems to be that everybody here is an archaeologist, but actually I'm an architect. Uh, ah, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm an architect and I, I'm talking from Brazil. So I actually, I don't know how it's going to work but I actually prepared just a small presentation, if it's that okay to share the screen. 
Yeah, please feel free. I saw that you were an architect and got very excited about your ideas of urban planning. So please do share. Okay. Oh, oh wait, did I get a, I get a thumb of no, no sharing? Oh gosh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I said, I can't see the entire screen right away. Um, one second. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Plumas, uh, should, is she okay to share her screen? Can anyone, are we allowed to do that? Or? Yes, just one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, oh okay, gosh, no, I see yeah. the YouTube is like very slow. So I saw someone shake and I was like, oh no. <laughs> okay, then. Yes, okay, then I think the answer is yes. So yeah, there we go. Yeah. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Oh great, that's great. So guys, uh well, I'm just starting. <laughs> um I, it's just because I thought that we could start just uh, talking a little bit about the basics first, and then I would like to show you some examples from Brazil. And then I also thought about uh, a few questions that we could discuss. So, well, at first, I just would like to introduce myself. As I said before, I'm an architect. I'm from Brazil. I have a master's from Cardiff University. And basically my experience is with urban conservation. And I also work as a professor and coordinator of the undergraduate course of architecture and urbanism in Sergipe, which is the city, uh, is, which is the state I live. And well, to be honest, I'm really passionate about architecture and education. Um, I honestly think that we and future generations, we must care for the built environment. So of course, it's, it's the place where we live. So um, when we talk about cultural heritage, we talk about built environment. So uh, as I said, I don't know exactly who is joining us today. So I thought, why not start from the basics? And when we think about the basics is uh, talking about the definition. So just very briefly talking about the definition in a broad way, because you all here know that this topic is very, um, it's a massive topic. So I, I was asked by email to talk about it, about the, top, the subject in 10 minutes. So I will try my best to summarize everything in 10 minutes. Um, so we might not be able to do a whole 10 minutes because we still have to get through a bunch of like other questions that people have submitted. So I just ah, want to okay. like let you know that you would probably only be able to use five minutes and then we can kind of go off of that because yeah, we do have like other questions and other participants that want to kind of jump on board. So I'm gonna give you five minutes and try okay, your best. All right, so five minutes. All right, so when we talk about cultural heritage, it's a scientific practice in a discipline, of course, that I don't have time to talk about um, the origin and it historically. But uh, as any other social discipline, uh, cultural heritage has been evolving because it is changing as society changes. So um, basically, when we talk about heritage, cultural heritage, it's the record of human existence. It talks about identity and sense of belonging. Uh, talking about the characteristics, we have tangible, intangible, and natural aspects. Um, so tangible, we talk about monuments and architecture. Intangible, we talk about costumes, uh, language, habits, traditions. And natural, we are talking about the environment and biodiversity. And uh, where can we find it? So I, when I say formal and informal, formal, I'm talking about museum, collection, and archives. And informal, it's just the words out there because 
when you talk about urban art, when you talk about when you when you travel, when you talk to people, when you see different um, different ways of speaking, accents, and etc. This is the informal area that I'm talking about. So just to sh just to show a little bit about uh, the international bodies, we when we think about cultural heritage, we think about UNESCO and ICAMAS. Um, and I just want to show a few examples from Brazil because Brazil has 23 sites inscribed in the World Heritage List by UNESCO. And these World Heritage Lists are places that are considered of exceptional and universal value uh, to the culture of humanity. So Brazil actually has 23, 14 are cultural heritage sites. Uh, one is mixed and seven are natural sites. This is a list from UNESCO's website. I think it's a good idea for everybody here to visit the website to maybe, maybe there is a place um, that you don't know. Maybe there are information for you to know more about your own culture. So yeah, if you would like idea. to share those into the chat, um, people then could access them afterwards. So if you wouldn't mind copy and paste them into the chat. I think people will be able to have that. Ah, ah, sure. I mean, this is the website from Brazil's list, but I'm talking about like everyone here, like just typing their own country and UNESCO on Google so they could see the, all the, the list of the places. Because you can actually, maybe, you never know, you can find a new place to go on your next trip. So you will find more about your own culture. Uh, in the list of Brazil, the one that I would like to show, the first one is the capital of Brazil, which is Brasilia. Uh, the capital of Brazil was built in the 60s, and I'm not sure if it's well known, because I think that people, when they think about Brazil, they think about Rio and Sao Paulo, but actually Brasilia is uh, a word here. It's it's on the World Heritage List because it's uh, an example of uh, from the modernist uh, principles. So it has ideas and it has um, basically the architecture from Le Corbusier, from Walter Gropius, from Bauhaus, from uh, it is it is. Uh, a clear example of modern urbanism. So that's why I, that's why Brasilia is on the list. And it was, uh, uh, cool. yeah, the idea was from the architect of Kanye Maia, which is internationally known in Lucia Costa. And I also okay, um, brought- I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay so that five was five minutes. minutes. All right. yeah. um, if you could yeah. send that to us, I think we can pop in. Uh, if you have an email that you can access to, we can probably send you like an email for you to send that to us so oh, that maybe we okay. can share just, some of your presentation. Yeah, yeah no problem. I just uh, I just maybe had a, a different idea how it was gonna work, but I, yeah, sure, it's okay. It was, yeah, no, I was just basically showing, yeah. Uh, let me yeah, I mean, that. Sharing. I think it does open up a great um, segue though. We could always ask, like you, you touched on the urbanism and how even modern interpretations of like the buildings, it's a modern building being placed in Brazil. Um, we could talk about architecture in that sense. Uh, obviously we uh, come from different backgrounds if for each for archeologists, art, art historians or architects. I think a lot mm -hmm. of us can see cultural heritage differently or in different ways in our own hometowns perhaps. So I'm gonna open the floor. Um, I can, I, I think I'll actually ask Amelia because Amelia has um, obviously she travels, she has a unique experience as uh, someone who uses sign language as her main form of communication. I think what is one of the ways, Amelia, I'll ask this to you. What is something that you see in your day-to-day -day that is a great example of like the preservation of cultural heritage, um, either in a modern building or just in, a, in an interaction that you've had and we'll kind of go from there. Please just take it away. <laughs> okay, to be completely honest, here in the Western United States, I mostly focus on um, colonialism. 
more like uh, French history and preserving it from the that time forward and the 1920s on and not really before that time. So our law, um, Section 106 law, really focuses on the history of property. So in my opinion, I think that property history is included um, way back, not just from the 1920s on, I think it goes back further. Um, so people's understanding of the property history, I think, should also include before the 1920s is regarding to preservation. So I think that could uh, improve our thinking here in the Western United States and um, and especially understanding the law and um, the language more specifically and architectural uh, and historical preservation is included in that. Is that what yeah. you've no Is that what you've noticed in Brazil? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? It just seems like from your preservation uh, presentation that you have focused on like a different type of history preservation. Um, it's just interesting because you included modern architecture, which we typically don't as archaeologists. Uh, well, to be honest, uh, modern architecture was the first example, but I also had other examples focused in the colonial period, as, for example, our first capital, which is Salvador. It's from the 1545, but there is I mean, there are studies about conservation of modern architecture, but they are quite recent. So, I mean, in Brazil, you have examples of um, studies focusing on uh, the conservation of modern architecture, but there are also uh, studies about colonial architecture and basically, yeah, so, I mean, uh, according from your background, do you have any idea why um, there is like no no focus on modern architecture? It's just the law. I feel like. Uh white people make these laws and no one really, the, peop the people who are um, in charge really um, don't uh, focus on changing things or uh, switching it around. For example, and to be completely honest, um, in Salt Lake City, and there's local organizations and all these different things um, and diverse organizations. It, we don't, they don't include people, archeologists um, are not included in those decisions. We don't get really any outreach efforts towards us. Um, we don't get anything and it, specifically deaf people um, for us to be involved and um, to share our culture of ASL and deaf history, we don't have a lot of um, opportunities to share that or um, give that around. It's really lacking in the cultural sense. So we try and take opportunities to um, meet with different organizations and different groups, but I think to focus solely on um, this specific topic, there's not a lot of deaf culture involved. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point, is a lot of what, what we do isn't necessarily inquired about when it comes to the modern landscape. Uh, basically, we either come in to preserve and then that's it. People then build on top of our own work that we've just done. Um, but there is not a lot of collaboration. And there was a question that someone had actually asked before we even got to this talk about tourism and how we should, like, do we think that we should be approaching tourism, especially in an urban landscape, um, differently? How do we 
uh, include a general public into that discussion? And I think that's actually a, a great, I, um, like a great question. I wanted to actually ask that. Um, I mean, I can open it up to anyone who wants to answer, but basically, how do we incorporate historians and uh, archaeologists into the conversation of architects and, and urbanists? And how do we help uh, bridge the gap between populations that already exist in a modern world that's trying to build there? Can I, can I jump in here? Uh, yes, and then Rachel can go next because I saw her hand up, so. Cool. Uh, so, hey, everyone. My name is Timothy James. Uh, I'm an archaeologist and a paleontologist based here in Southern California. Uh, the primary focus on my career is uh, working at, in mitigation paleontology and archaeology in order to mitigate the damage that development does to our built uh, environment and our cultural heritage. So I actually, uh, I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement in the archeological community when it comes to us actually getting out and um, practicing science communication. So it's all about getting outside of your echo chamber. So we always talk about getting more people involved. We always talk about getting more people interested in the research, but what I fail to see in practice, at least here in the United States, is people, they go and they present their research at the AIA, the SAAs, but they're in this bubble of anthropologists and archeologists, and it's all the same people who would still research that data anyway. I think there needs to be a push by the younger generation of scientists to improve our methods of science communication and properly show why it's important that we do this, why we're working to preserve cultural heritage, why we should preserve beautiful modernist architecture like some of the stuff we see in Palm Springs or in Brasilia, why we should care about um, you know, the built environment of different colonial stages and why we should care about the built environment of indigenous people and their respective communities. I think a lot of it relies on us um, as figures uh, and as scientists, we have to become involved uh, with the communication process and we have to really um, be more tenacious in seeking out opportunities to discuss the science. We need to think of ourselves as ambassadors to the science, not just archeologists who are going to work. So uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a little bit of my take. I feel like uh, there is room for improvement, but um, I feel like as long as people, the general public can see that the passion that we have for preservation, they'll understand that same passion. I feel like the, the desire is there. There's just a disconnect with the information. I think it's up to us to uh, solve that disconnect. So that's yeah, what I, I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah, 100%. Rachel, can you elaborate on that and take it um, away from there? Yeah, kind of going back to your original question about like the integration of archaeology and architecture. I think that's really interesting because actually the first job that I worked here in Scotland, I was working for a um, archaeology com company that's actually part of an architectural practice that um, specializes in historic buildings. And we were doing a project where they had um, taken a building along one of the main thoroughfares in Edinburgh that was an old cottage that was part of the uh, Edinburgh Botanic Gardens and had dismantled it and then were rebuilding it um, at the new site of the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens. So I think that there's definitely a lot of potential for archaeologists and architects to work together. Um, and I, I think it happens a lot, perhaps more here in the UK than in somewhere like the US where we have things like listed buildings and you have um, things happening where people are like transforming those buildings, but still retaining the essential character of them. Um, but I think um, like things like this business that I, I worked for where it's a lot more integrated where they, they, they just work together on a daily basis is a really great example of ways that we could continue to do that. And then in terms of incorporating local uh, tourism and stuff, I think we as a discipline need to maybe take um, a bigger step in being involved in tourism because I feel like in my experience, archeologists uh, don't exactly have the best opinion of tourists. <laughs> 
sometimes, um, especially in terms of like, if you're working on a site in the middle of a city and there's like a bunch of people just like taking pictures of you while you're at work, that feels like really invasive. Or sometimes when you're under a deadline on a, a site, you don't want to be like giving a site tour to like the local people that week. Um, but I really think activities like that are, are what's really, really important is to do things like having open site days when you're working in a farmer's field next to a village or when you're working in the middle of a city, having up like information boards to tell people about the sites and stuff. Or even it could be so far as like having, you know, like a tourism company where you give tours about the archaeology of a city as well as the history. So yeah, that's my spiel. No, that that's brilliant because it kind of it makes me think of if anyone's ever played the oh Amelia, she had a she has something to say. Go for it. Oh yes, I did. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to add. Oh okay. Sorry, I was fine. <laughs> you you do see that my hand is up. Okay. I uh, wanted to give uh, my about the tourism you were talking about. Uh, one problem with that, I know it's great and uh, architect here in Colorado as, a, as an architect. So I had experienced uh, people, events, advertising, come on, look at our dig site. So what happened is uh, they didn't include the accessibility information. Were they gonna provide the sign language interpreter? Um, did they have the wheelchair accessibility for all of the people, deafblind people, things like that? Um, the, they have tactile sign language interpreters for that. Um, they didn't provide that. They didn't include everyone that was interested in focusing on this dig site because it was a huge event in Colorado. So it was specifically for the same type of people, like, like he was just saying, Timothy was just saying, the same type of people and the same pool of people that came because they didn't make it accessible for other volunteers and things like that, anybody that wanted to come to the event. Um, so when you're not including everyone, um, it's just a, it, that, that civility part of it. It's a big issue um, with the tourism uh, in general. Typically, um, not being included means you're not going to go and excluding other people. Um, as well. So I just felt like that was the one thing that we needed to work on as well, talking about communication. Um, if you're in, in have a quick presentation of what the dig is about, um, the history, uh, and the day of the event, just have it a couple of hours and then provide those accessibility measures to include everyone um, that would be interested for the advertisement. So that's one thing that is, is a huge gap. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, that's one of those things we can segue into is obviously this is the chat for the 21st century. Oh, we have another hand raised. Go for it. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I'm Dumisha Dolama and I'm an anthropologist from South Africa. And with regards to preserving heritage and um, architecture and infra infrastructure, it's a bit difficult for us this side because we have just... I mean, I wouldn't say just, but we were involved in a bad date and it's been a couple of years since that ended. So there is a clash of cultures in terms of like who, which hair, which culture is the one that we should preserve. And so it becomes an issue. Um, one of the examples is a statue that was up that was by Rhodes and lots of people were against it. So I think because we have so many cultures here, it's an issue in terms of who, what, how do we preserve these infrastructures and how do we go on with cultural heritage? Okay, next person who had their hand up. There's literally a little hand up. That's adorable. Uh, go for it. <laughs> Can I go now? <laughs> yes. I'm really sorry. I rose my hand a while ago, but apparently this item didn't work and no one saw it. So I actually, hi, my name is Laura, aka Plumas, and I am not an archaeologist, like not at all. I'm a medievalist, I'm an art historian, and I want to just pick up where Timothy left, which is these gap mentioning. And this is where I come straight, like, I, like a train smashing it through, because that's the thing. We, and I mean we, the community, the researchers, we need to step down with our ivory towers because history is not ours, cultural heritage is not ours, is from everybody's. Yes, Tim, say it louder for the people at the back. Yes, exactly. And this is why I opened a project like mine, which is Das Blumen des Mood, where I share cultural heritage about Iran and Mesopotamia, and also 
uh, projects like Tasha's, I don't know if Tasha is here, uh, behind the Trowel, I think it's pronounced, oh no, I'm Spanish, I don't know English, I can't speak English. <laughs> so, so these kind of projects that actually show the connection, I mean, I always say this, which is that we, I mean, the, the big intention should be building bridges and not walls, because there's plenty of walls in this world, and like feeling like that there's a gap, there's not a gap, it's just people don't know they could be interested, because so the people with the information do not bother to share it. And as Timothy was saying, and I could see perfectly, you know, these same people who go to speak for the same people they will have to go to listen to. And it's like, we need to break the circle. And that's, that's what I love most to do. And then going back to what actually, I think sometimes for the general public, at least when you think about cultural heritage, for some reason, you tend to think about architecture the most. But when I share about it, I also, at least in Spain, we also talk about food, music, theater, poetry, um, literature of any kind, mythology, because that's that's my thing. That's like the, the creatures that do not exist. That's my good. And I also like to, I know he's here. I know he's listening. I know he can see me. There's Nadim, what he does, like as in, he calls it dressing up. He doesn't dress up. He does reenactment and he shows and he's very didactical and he's very teaching. So I think... I just wanted to just give a big round of applause to Timothy for raising that topic. He's like, yes, thank you. That's the big problem. It's like, there we go. There's Nadim. So yeah, it's off, off to you, brother. You, you take the stage now. Yeah, no, because that was an excellent point. I think I have a lot of friends that obviously are not in the same field. And that is always their thing of, well, how do I access any of this? Or how do I understand what I'm reading? Or how do I even wrap my head around what is being said to begin with? And I had one friend who played the Assassin's Creed games and they recently came out with the virtual tours. And I was like, what a great example of how the 21st century can come in and communicate information on a level that is interactive and understanding. So I wanted to open the floor up for like, this probably be the final question that we can fit into because seeing as we all like to chat about it, how do we think that technology can help the general public as well as ourselves in various fields communicate and understand other people's fields of interest and research? So I think technology is great um, because social media has given us the opportunity to share archaeology in ways never before is possible. So I, uh, in my own experience, I started making an archaeology TikTok uh, talking about some of the excavation work I did in Deadwood's historic Chinatown in Deadwood, South Dakota. Some of those videos got hundreds of thousands of views. And it had people from all walks of life, from all political backgrounds, from all racial, ethnic, and class backgrounds, all interested in what was going on in Deadwood's Chinatown in the 1860s. So I feel like it's really up to us when we're working in the field and we see an opportunity, it's a cool photo, or we see an opportunity, we, we gotta unleash our inner Steve Irwin and we gotta go out and we just gotta show our passion for the science and we gotta show that to the general public. Every day I work with construction workers uh, as a mitigation scientist. One of the best ways I'm able to make the job easier for me and them is by getting them excited. And they come to me and they're like, Tim, we've worked with other archeologists, but they've never shown us the artifacts. They've never articulated why this is cool. And if you can show the public why something's cool, then they're more likely to support legislation that will preserve what we're working for. Yeah, that's the biggest thing is like we, we need the funding to do it and we need legislation to help with it. Um, I wanted to uh, ask, let's see, who have we not heard from? Uh, Nadim, Nadim, would you like to jump on in? Because we haven't heard from you yet. Um, hello, uh, y'all can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, good. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Nadim. My camera's off, but my mic's working clearly. Um, so I want to preface this by saying I'm, I'm not actually formally trained in history or archaeology or, or, or anything, really. Um, so um, kind of coming on from what, what Laura said earlier, um, I'm a reenactor, which means that what I do is I reconstruct uh, stuff from olden times. Um, and it's, it's done very informally. Um, but um, so get, going back into outreach, um, what I found is that my platform has been 
actually pretty successful at getting people engaged and interested in the field that I do, which actually what I cover is um, early medieval pre-Islamic uh, Sogdiana and Bactria, which I'm in the UK. So like no one's heard of this at all, um, <laughs> but it's, um, it's a good way for getting people to have heard of it. And the other thing, what it does is it, is it makes the history quite personal. Um, so like, you know, when you're, when you're taught history or, or if you're playing video games, um, you kind of have like a world map and there's like splodges of color on it. And you kind of think of historical entities as like a king and his army and like a map which has a border. But no one really thinks about stuff like, um, oh, this is ceramics. This is how people wrote. This is what their textiles were made out of. Um, and people tend, I, I found that people connect with that a lot better than they do with um you know, maps and stuff. That's been my experience. Um, on the technology side of things, I've already alluded to it just now, but um, I think video games are actually a really powerful tool for getting people involved. That's actually what got me interested in the first place, like God knows how many you know, decades ago now. Um, it's a shame that a lot of video games are, um, number one, like very Eurocentric, and number two, a lot of game designers don't necessarily pay that much attention to actual historical accuracy. Um, but I guess that's, that's um, I guess we have modding teams for that. So, so it's not an unsurmountable challenge. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you, that, that's my input, yeah. No, that was um, excellent. Can I just jump in? I think that that's a really good point that he made about video games because actually, I would also say that video games are like one of the first things that brought me into archeology span when I was a kid. I started playing this like um, my, my dad got the game for me and it was like, uh, you build cities in ancient Egypt. And I just thought it was, it's called Pharaoh. You can buy it on steam. Highly recommend. <laughs> um, I, I had that as well game. years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah same. And I feel a <laughs> fan of Age of Empires here. Am I the only one? <laughs> I, 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 I played it once one. or twice, but the, the <laughs> Pharaoh, the and then they also Egypt. had like, Roman games, they had Greek ones, they have a Chinese one as well. And I think that they're really, um, as the technology goes, they're a really great example because they reach such a wider audience than people who are interested in history because you don't necessarily need an interest in history to pick up that game. And also I think there's a lot of um, potential hopefully going forwards for more accuracy because like Nadim was saying, like that Assassin's Creed game like I, at least the Egyptian one that they did, apparently they did like tons and tons of research to try and um, actually or accurately portray the period in time, which I think was Cleopatra's reign. So when I played it, like in Alexandria, everyone's speaking Greek and then you go into the middle of Egypt and people are speaking a different language and you actually really see how these things would have looked in real life. So I think it'd be really cool to see how that stuff also translates into virtual reality going forward and like the possibility of being able to like sort of not really time travel back into another time and actually see what these things were like. Yeah, that's I think that's the dream of all of us to be able to time travel without the hassle of time traveling. <laughs> Just um, jumping in here again, also... if you don't mind. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, so so I'm uh, so speaking of um, VR, is I am actually very slowly working on a VR project. Um, the thing with VR is I don't know how accessible it is because I've used VR headsets like like the phone, Google Cardboard, and they kind of suck. Um, and the Oculuses are um, they're pricey. Um, the quality is like you know it, it's way better. But um, so one of the things that I kind of want to do and. Um, I'll, I will need to get permissions from the Hermitage uh, in St. Petersburg to actually do this, is to reconstruct one of the Sogdian um, rooms, um, like the, the paintings and everything, the architecture, and stick it in a VR environment, um, which I think would be a, a, an interesting um, opportunity. Um, going back to media again, sorry, just to keep having this point, point home. In addition to video games, we have movies and TV shows. Uh, I, there was a very interesting trend that I noticed. So recently there was the Vikings TV show, which like all, everything is like the costuming is, is terrible. I, it is, it's like stereotypical Hollywood barbarian -y costuming. But one of the weird trends that I noticed um, like while the Vikings TV show was on shortly after, there was a surge of Viking reenactors. And interestingly enough, a lot of them actually ended up with pretty decent kit. So what must have happened is this TV show must have got people interested in it, who then went and did their own informal, you know, non-academic research, um, which is, is easier and easier to do in higher quality because of the internet. And there's a lot of, you know, social media groups dedicated to 
sharing excerpts from papers and books and stuff. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fairly accessible. Um, and, and yeah, like, like this, this TV show kind of led to a weird surge in the Viking reenactment community. Um, yeah. We yeah. see the same wow. thing in paleontology after Jurassic Park. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Okay, everybody, I think we're going to have to ask some final questions and wrap up because we only have about three minutes and then we got to get to panel three. So let me check real quick to see if there's anything in the chat. If anyone had a question while I check the chat, uh, please do ask it. Oops. But. Okay. Oh, sorry. I like disappeared there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> basically, let's see. Um, we asked about the importance of heritage and tourism. Yep, we talked about that. Uh, developing technologies. Yes, we talked a bit about that. Wow, you guys really did cover a lot of these questions. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Okay, does anyone have any final questions? Well, because I think the majority of these we've done really well. So two minutes, the floor is yours. One final question to end them all. If not, I will basically have to just say thank you for this amazing discussion. What's everybody's favorite archeological site? Mine is Chaco <laughs> Canyon in New Mexico. Now that is a good question, yeah. <laughs> Mine is Persepolis in Iran because I'm a basic person who studies aeronology. I'm lying, it will be Persepolis or uh, Tikal in Guatemala. Mm. I did graffiti in Tikal, absolutely amazing. 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> Mine is just all of them. I could never pick a favorite. <laughs> I have so many interests in, in archeology span and history from like all over the world. Um, I just really, I could never pick like one site to be my absolute favorite. <laughs> okay. Anybody what about else? you, Amelia? Amelia? What is your favorite archeological site? If you have, you can go and choose every single one like Rachel just did. She's a winner. Okay. Well then, I guess we've come to the end, everybody. Uh, the next panel discussion, I believe is about uh, technology. Let me look that up. Or I might not be able to look it up real quick. Um, but <laughs> Let's see. Oh no, I have no clue. Third panel, it's up soon, 10 minutes. Please go join it. Um, this has been fantastic. You guys have all been amazing. And I think like we said before, it's nice to finally see everyone's faces and put, put a face to the social media accounts that I tend to see. So no, absolutely great job, everybody. 10 out of 10, could not have done it without you. It was nice to meet everyone. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, follow me at The Hollywood Naturalist.